if it's really the case that sex work is work, then what is the problem with being asked by your boss to give them a blowjob? It's work. It's just a service. It's like being asked to do overtime or make a coffee. No one actually thinks that it's just like making a coffee. Louise Perry, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Given your political background, how does it feel to have Ben Shapiro quote tweeting your work? I, <laughs> I didn't know he had. Did you not see this? No. Let me tell you. So <laughs> there is a tweet that uh, someone put out a couple of days ago explaining about how don't kink shame the naked men doing parades in front of children and twerking in front of cops. Oh. And that was one photo, which was a news story. And the other photo was the chapter list from your book, <laughs> which said things I've like got, men you know, and women are different and uh, yeah. loveless sex is not empowering. And it yeah, said, yeah. Um, uh, people of the West choose your future. Something like that. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. That, yeah, okay, that, that, that explains things. I have, a, I have quite a, like a heavy notification filter on on Twitter, so I don't always see everything. Um, the contents page, though, completely blew up like three months ago, long before the book was published. Yeah, they just, the publisher just put up online the cover, the title, the fact that Kathleen Stock wrote the foreword because she's got a kind of existing reputation among, among her haters, my haters, and the contents page. And that was enough to have like a several day Twitter storm. Why do you think that was? Those statements. I mean, I guess because... I mean, I did I did write the chapters with the knowledge that they're like, they're simultaneously obvious and also incredibly provocative, which was which was like precisely my intention, because to some because some people read it. I mean, some people read the whole book, but some people read the chapter titles in particular and they're like, yeah. And other people read them as like. F fascist, basically. I mean, like, like, so, like, so politically outrageous. I mean, I'd say that the response to the book so far, it's only been out for a couple of weeks in the UK and not yet in the States, is um, like 80% really positive and 20% complete outrage. And not very much in the middle. <laughs> I think, well, what do you think is going to happen when it comes out in America? It's <sighs> a good question. I mean, the, the, like, the culture war is more intense in America in every way. It's so similar, I think, to what we have here. I mean, actually, I think we import it, really. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I, like, I did, that, like, British political context is different from American, right? And I write for the New Statesman magazine, for instance, which is a, like, traditionally left-wing outlet, um, I have come from the left, even if I wouldn't necessarily consider myself still a part of the left and so on. So like, I hope that the book doesn't just get treated as like yet another socially conservative take on the sexual revolution. Because even if I'm reaching some conservative conclusions, I'm doing it via different priors, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, d didn't you say I start from feminist priors and end up with socially conservative conclusions? Yeah, some socially conservative conclusions, yeah. Um, which means that there's sort of something in it for everyone to hate. <laughs> <laughs> Except have... Ben Shapiro, Except apparently. Where? He's not read the whole thing. I'm not sure how he might think about some of the early chapters. <laughs> well, look, you've been co-opted by the right wing of America now, and this is your future. So the, I, I was at um, the Heterodox Academy, Jonathan Haidt's organization. Oh, yeah. I was at that the conference for that this weekend. One of the speakers said something that kind of, I think, sort of it is a good synopsis of of the thesis of your book that says there are many ways to change the world few will make it better many will make it worse mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah it's true there's a roger scruton quote like that i can't remember exactly how it's phrased but um something like it's really easy to break things and it's really hard to make things which I think is um, is like a really fundamentally conservative observation and true. What's wrong with the sexual revolution then? So my argument in the book is basically that there are some really important ways in which men and women are different from one another. So some of those differences are physical and should be fairly obvious. Like only women can get pregnant. Men are bigger and stronger than women are. 
on average, like on average, but also that the difference is massive between the between the means. And also there are psychological differences, which a lot of feminism of the last half century or more has been really invested in minimizing, but are I think definitely there if you look at the research. Um, and if also you just look at the world around you. Um, one of those differences, for instance, is that ma- male sexuality is different from female sexuality on average, that men are more likely to be into things like casual sex, watching porn, buying sex, um, all things that have become much more socially acceptable post-sexual revolution. And my argument basically is that the sexual revolution was kicked off by the pill, and the which which did a pretty good job of severing the link between sex and reproduction and it's kind of gave the impression that sex could just be a leisure activity that it didn't have to mean anything it could just be sort of a bit of fun and my argument is actually that that idea that sex is just just a bit of fun it doesn't really mean anything suits male interests much more than it does female because casual sex in particular is just one one men want it more than women do and two women carry all of the risks associated with it like physical risks like pregnancy and violence and so on um so my argument basically is it's a bad deal for but them. originally it was the sort of thing that was pushed by liberals and feminists right this is exactly the sort it's of thing still, yeah. yeah 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 i mean the yeah so the the popular narrative that i'm challenging is one that the sexual revolution was like a feminist accomplishment and i don't think that's true i mean which is not to say that there aren't some things about it that have been good for women i mean if I mean, if you look at the story of recent decades in particular, there are all sorts of ways in which women are doing great, actually. Like women are women are going to university more often than men are. They are right up until they have children are doing better in the workplace. You know, this is it's not to say that like everything is like the battle of the sexes. Women are like losing across the board, not at all. Um, but I think in terms of sexual culture, that I'm concerned. I'm concerned for women. I'm also concerned for men. I mean, there's a lot in the book about for instance, the really malign influence of porn on young men, like like in a superficial and short term way, it's great to be a really attractive man in this sexual culture, right? You can basically attract as many partners as you like, you know, consequence free sex is, is freely available to you. But I think actually in the long run, that's not a very, that's not a happy way to live your life. You say that your complaint is focused more against liberals than conservatives. Why is that? I mean, because I'm expecting liberals to read it. <laughs> I might be wrong about that, but I that that's the space that I'm coming from originally. Like I went to I went to such a left wing university. Where did um, you go? I went to SOAS in London. I don't even know what that is. It's like a really really small, really crazy university. So I'm like, so I you know I've. I've read all of the, all of this radical stuff as a student, and I'm coming from a feminist background, and coming from, um, as I said, the new the new statesman that I work for is 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 historically left wing. So I'm kind of I'm trying to speak to those people, um, but I mean the books for conservatives as well because there are bits in it that I think every everyone will will find. Um, We'll find challenging. But it's not just... the fact that a lot of what you're talking about here is conserving some fairly traditional views around men's and women's roles with each other about sort of chivalrous conduct and having constraints on the way that men and their aggression and their desire for multiple sexual partners, like that, that is a fundamentally conservative value. So it, it seems to me like the conservatives would have far less to disagree with you. Not again, there's something for everybody to disagree with, but... Mm-hmm that the conservatives would probably have far less than the new wave of liberals? Probably, yeah. Although I should say that the this idea of like constraining male sexuality, which is which is 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 central to my thesis basically, um, it is conservative in the sense that it was it was considered to be like a mainstream idea before sexual revolution in the West. But if you look across time and place, like that's not necessarily considered like a trad thing to do. I mean, like if you look, for instance, at antiquity, the idea that some high status man would have access to sexual access to his underlings was like completely accepted. It's really, I don't know if you've read Tom Holland's book, Dominion. 
No, you don't mean Tom Holland, the guy that plays Spider-Man, do you? I, no, I don't. <laughs> a, a common, a common mistake. No, um, no, he's a British academic and historian writer, um, and he's got this fantastic book called Dominion, which is about um, basically about history of Christianity and the ways in which Christianity influences the modern world, even if we consider ourselves to be a religious or post-Christian. Um, and he has a bit in there where he talks about me too. Um, and it really triggered a lot of my thinking about this, actually, was a few years ago, where he points out that in, say, the Roman world, no one would think that Harvey Weinstein was doing anything wrong. Like the idea that this guy who's at the top of the top of the tree of his particular hierarchy would be able to have sexual access to anyone kind of subordinate to him was like, yeah, obviously. And actually, the idea that he should be. That he should be constrained is Holland argues a very Christian idea, um, and you know I'm I'm not Christian. I'm not coming at this from a religious perspective, um, but it's worth pointing that out. You know, like this is not necessarily a normal thing to think. Well, the <laughs> the window of trad sort of shifts over time, right? Like no one's actually going that far back. So okay, so the sexual revolution happens. Like surely women have benefited with. Uh, no more shame and stigma around enjoying sex and stuff like that. Like who who benefited from the sexual revolution overall? Yeah, so the shame and stigma thing. I mean, yes, that is definitely one outcome. I mean, like, I think that one of the one of the things that I'm trying to push in this book, and, and that is I shared with um, like Mary Harrington and Nina Power that you've had on the show before. They that we yeah we're on this we're on the same page about this. Like challenging the idea of progress. Um, particularly from a feminist perspective, this idea that um, history has a shape and everything is always getting better and better, and that the sexual revolution, you know, everything post sexual revolution is necessarily better than what came before. I just don't think is true. I think that's nonsense. Like, we're looking at a massive historical event triggered primarily by technology. Of course, there are going to be upsides and downsides, you know. Um, the yeah, so I think it is absolutely the case that that women now can be much more open about sexuality and are more able to enjoy <clears throat> sex in certain circumstances and stuff. That's true. But I also think that to some extent, like, we're social animals and we're very responsive to norms. And what I think has happened is kind of uh, the norms have just spun on a sixpence. And now, whereas previously it would have been the case that young women, for instance, w were like protecting their virginity and their reputation for being chaste and so on was considered very important socially. Now, if anything, it's the opposite or not quite the opposite, but that now the pressure actually is on for women to be up for it. And to be just as like sexually adventurous as, as the guys and, you know, like there's it's like a slightly painful um there's a contradiction within that, which is really hard to navigate for young women. Where on the one hand, like, it's good to be sexually open. It's good to sort of um, base your reputation on being really sexy. But also there is actually a penalty if your body count is too high, which is quite, which is quite difficult. And I think a lot of young women don't necessarily realise that as well. Like, they're actually treading a really difficult tightrope. Um which is why I think this idea of like, oh, well, people can do whatever they want now. Like, you know, we're all we're all free to behave as we want sexually. I just don't think it's true because ev we like every culture has expectations in relation to sex, has norms in relation to sex. I think that what we've done, though, is that we had some quite deeply embedded norms which were thrown out the window as a consequence of the sexual revolution and now there's like a sort of halting effort to maybe rebuild them sometimes they're in, they're implicit and it's kind of the wild west out there basically and i don't I, who's, in, who's enforcing this then where's this coming from are you suggesting I, I, that men are weaponizing women to believe that they should have a particular type of uh, sexual proclivity that then plays into men's hands because they get more variety? I don't think there's a conspiracy. I don't think that anyone is enforcing it. I think that it's just everyone like responding to incentives as individuals. Um, and that knits together to create the, the culture that we see before us. So 
like yeah it is in, it is in the interests of of men who want to sleep around to encourage women to to match them you know in that kind of behavior so that's clearly going on at an individual level but then in terms of like women's magazines encouraging their readers to do the same I have some I I I did a lot of digging through women's magazines for this book and um like there are some really grim (laughs) articles out there what were your least favorite headlines I can't remember exactly the wording of it but there's a whole genre of um articles in women's in women's media about encouraging women not to catch feelings or I mean the way that it's phrased is um how anyone of any gender cannot catch feelings when they're having casual sex and how to have casual sex in like a fun feminist way etc etc but like we know that women are much more likely to bond quickly with their sexual partners we know that they're just much less likely to like casual sex um something that's a really interesting and really marked difference between men and women on average on in um sexuality is women's sexual disgust threshold is a lot lot lower so women will get the ick much easier than, than men will but if you're going to participate if you're going to have sex like a man you have to overcome all of those instincts right and so there's a this whole genre of women's mags that will basically like instruct their young readers in how to suppress their instincts and have sex that actually they kind of know deep down they shouldn't be having which i think is really bleak <laughs> and yeah and and i think that just representing that as feminist in any way interestingly I- looking at it from a man's perspective i i agree that this is bad for women i don't think that it serves their interests i think that the biological predisposition that women have when it comes to sexual partners trying to decouple having sex first off having sex and and, and making babies was decoupled but then having sex and um having emotions getting attached was decoupled and that second one the the pill for that is i mean you know what is it is it it's 10 vodkas deep like does that really help (laughs) you know you wake up in the morning and you feel but Mm. you use this uh, analogy about the fact that Marilyn Monroe was a, a sort of very attractive woman that was weaponized, commercialized, utilized by a society that wanted to sexualize women. And this was at the benefit of Hughes, Hugh Hefner's, the sort of uh, yeah. high status man who was able to sleep with lots of women and, and continue to do this. I agree. I think that you're right. It is bad for women, but very few men are Hughes. And what you're seeing in the modern society is this most women are probably dissatisfied with the way that their sexual um, uh, pursuits are going. Mm-hmm. Most men now, the number of men reporting no sex between the ages of 18 and 30 has tripled to nearly 30% in the last 10 years. So yeah. the Matthew principle kicks off here. So I think on average, it's bad for pretty much everybody. I think that the sort yeah. of amount of sexual satisfaction has lowered for everybody and you have this huge underclass of sexless men which is where incel black pill MGTOW, red it's some parts of the red pill the manosphere men's rights mm-hmm. all of these movements are as far as i can see they're big copes from men who are now in a sort of sexual wasteland where they're really really struggling to find connection so i think that it's i understand that from a, a feminist perspective it is bad for women and that there are higher costs that they pay but being a listless liminal space man with no desire from any female that you give your attention to is not a good situation to be in either yeah i completely agree yeah i'd I'd add to that things like rates of erectile dysfunction among young men are like insanely high um which is probably to do with porn maybe also to do with estrogens in the environment i don't know goddamn estrogen some i was eating some edamame (laughs) beans the other day and everyone at the table who's like big into health and fitness looked disgusted (laughs) apparently edamame beans have got tons of estrogen in who you knew? can have a bit of soy, can't you? That's <sighs> don't, probably it. Don't get into <laughs> the soy argument. argument. But yeah, few men, few men yeah. are used, right? So they're the yeah. ones that are losing. Yeah, yeah, no, this is this is completely true. And I think as well that there's this like um, antagonism between feminists and like, in, let's say, incels broadly, um, which does, I think, very much come down to these innate differences between male and female sexuality and the fact that we don't really talk about them enough. At, which means I think that you end up with um, the sexes really misunderstanding each other, right? So, like, feminists will look at incels 
and like completely not understand why it would be so frustrating to be a young man who can't get laid like I think a lot of women are like surprisingly clueless about male sexuality in all sorts of ways like definitely the dark side of male sexuality but also just like its intensity I think most most women cannot can't just can't like directly empathize at all and similarly incels I think would look at women and be like but you can walk out into the street and pick up half a dozen guys you know within five minutes you must be living heaven on earth and women are like but I don't want that and so you end up with this everyone thinks that like the other the other side has it easy um which has a lot to do with the fact of just this like these quite fundamental biological differences making it hard for us to empathize with one another and this is added to a culture in which like not only are those sexuality differences routinely denied but like the 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 existence of sexual dimorphism is routinely denied like how can you possibly like successfully navigate the sexual landscape if you don't even think men and women exist as discrete categories do you think that inventing the pill was an error then (sighs) no because i think i mean socially no like that there are um Mary Harrington will probably talk to you about the environmental consequences of the pill. Um, and yeah, we've just mentioned estrogen. So that's like, that's another story. Socially, I think, no, I mean, I think it is, I'm personally grateful for the fact that my life is not entirely dominated by childbearing, which it would have been in a previous era. I'm not going to expect to have 10 children and to spend my whole life either pregnant or postpartum. Um, I think it's more that we haven't really negotiated with the social consequences and that's what I'm trying. That's the sort of conversation that I'm trying to initiate because we, you know, we have we have the power to. I'm not like a complete. I I I have a sort of materialist analysis of all of this, and I think in the end it does come down to um, things like the pill, things like changes in the economy. You know, I think so often you get the popular narrative of feminist history is basically sees it as being driven by particularly inspiring feminists who just kind of give really strong arguments and everyone's persuaded and this is what you know this is what gives us the vote this is what gives us access to professions whatever I don't think that's true I mean clearly there have been some very impressive feminists historically but I think the 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 real story of the last century is things like the washing machine yeah you said the washing machine helped liberate women more than any feminist did yeah I think Jordan Peterson has said the same thing he's completely right um he also mentions tampons. Yeah, yeah. There's all sorts of all sorts of technologies which make um, make it possible for women to have lives outside of their home or more outside of their home than previously. Um, and also changes to the economy, which means that you know if you're in a in a knowledge economy or a service economy where male physical strength doesn't have anything like the economic importance that it once did, women and men can participate basically as equals. Uh, you know, there are there are like obviously childbearing makes a difference but if you're if you're on the pill you're delaying childbearing um you're working at a laptop and you're operating in a very kind of gender neutral social sphere um you might not even you might not even like work out you might have no recognition of the fact that men and women are are profoundly physically different in terms of things like strength like from that perspective it looks as if the whole world is gender neutral um and so that's kind of that's that is the sort of social context in which this idea of the 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 differences between men and women being socially constructed or being trivial makes sense but actually that's like a very very superficial analysis of what's going on like actually i mean one the physical differences are still profound but also like those psychological differences go really deep because we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years of evolutionary history feeding into us having these really distinct reproductive roles and that and that leading to us having quite different modes of sexuality didn't you say that the uh usa women's football team was beaten by the dallas under 15s football team yeah yeah there's i there there are like several examples of this yeah of elite women's teams being beaten by teenage boys i think that the the fastest woman on the, in the 100 meters on the planet gets beaten by about 100 or 200 under 17s yeah in america 217 men in america i mean the whole yeah. f- like 
the discussion around uh, male and female physical strength differences are purely due to the fact that girls get told that they need to play with dolls and guys go and lift lift little trucks and stuff it feels like larping to me it feels like everybody is living this sort of charade and nobody can bear themselves to to pull out of it like it's <clears throat> that that's wild but when it comes to the psychological differences there's a little bit more um i guess plausible room for maneuver there because you can't see the manifest as much and when you've also got a discussion about people being able to transition from t- different genders uh, mm. the male brain and the female brain and traits that you put them on and take them off like clothes yeah and there are outliers you know there are there are like less so physically i mean you do sometimes get really strong women or whatever but even then i mean i do um my husband and i are both power lifters and just, I don't think that you can spend five minutes in a powerlifting gym and not be aware of the fact that men and women strength differences are massive. Even if there are obviously some really strong women. Do you pull conventional or sumo? Conventional. What about the husband? Also conventional. He Good. Doesn't... It's a family of non-cheaters. <laughs> I'm adamant that sumo's cheating. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, and then I see I've been you know training at this for years, and then I see like novice men warming up with my one rep max on bench like, <laughs> it's, just, it's just it's just like the pure reality of it but I mean if, pe- if people don't participate in those kind of sports also things like martial arts if you don't participate in that you wouldn't necessarily know it um but on the psychological differences yeah there there are there are more outliers there are some people who are really atypical for their sex and there clearly is like a lot of space for culture to intervene um but it's so on an individual level, if you know what if you know someone's sex, you don't necessarily know anything really about their personality. It's more that at the population level, when you're talking about millions of people, that's when you see it play out. And like something that is really interesting and really makes clear that how how profound these differences are is you look at things like university campuses and look at their sex ratio on campuses where there are more women than men so men are the rarer sex there's more hookup culture because the the rarer sex is able to set the terms more easily and then on campuses where there are more men than women you have the inverse is more monogamy and that's the sort of thing where yes there will be individual outliers but you can't deny the differences when you when you see it playing out in those kind of larger arenas well that sex ratio hypothesis is kind of the basis as well for a ton of hypergamy that as you have uh, an ever increasing group of high performing women and an ever decreasing group of underperforming men that are dropping out of college that aren't getting as educated women aged 21 to 29 earn 1111 pounds more on average than the equivalent man so during the period when women are seeking a mate they're unable to find what fundamentally on average women want to find a mate that is more statusful, wealthier, and better educated than they are. Those are the cues typically that they were attracted to. But now women are able to gain status, earn more, and become better educated than men at higher rates than men, which is what's causing this sort of upward tilt toward turbo chad at the top, sleeping Mm. with everybody, Mm. listless, sexless men, underclass down here, and then the wistful women and alpha widows that are in this sort of world. I, I mean, yeah. this is this is the most interesting dynamic that I think there is at the moment when it comes to dating. It's got downstream implications economically. It's got downstream mm-hmm. implications when you think about um, population growth, population decline, culture, uh, crime. You know, mm-hmm. you don't want this huge <laughs> underclass of sexless men roaming the streets. When you get into a relationship as a man, your testosterone goes down. When you have a child, your testosterone goes down again <laughs> because it's advantageous. It's adaptive for you to not be going out doing reckless shit when you've got a, a baby and a wife at home to look after. So all of this, I mean, this is just, I, I, it is by far the most interesting dynamic, I think, that's happening in the world at the moment. Yeah, and this is the subject of, a, so my last chapter is called Marriage is Good. Um, and a lot of people who've just seen the contents page sort of assume that it's a, you know, Christian argument or whatever. But actually, it's it's making exactly it's like a it's like a very rational secular argument for actually if you look at what happens to a society when you get rid of monogamous marriage and you compare our society now as it was in the past, and also look at societies where polygyny 
is the norm. Like most society, I think it's about 80% of societies on the anthropological record have had polygyny as a socially acceptable thing. So you end up with the, the, you know, the chads who are having multiple wives and then you've got men who never marry at all. And you do also have some monogamy in the middle. Like it's normally not quite that extreme, but that it seems is basically our natural state as a species. And because it's just it just recurs again and again and again. And that that minority of cultures that have been monogamous, including Western cultures, are unusual. But uh, and it's not like it does sort of have to be imposed. Like, you know, mo- like a lot of elite men will cheat, for instance. And, you know, they take on extra wives if they could. Like people monogamy is not really our natural state. It does have to be socially enforced, but it also is like amazingly successful anthropologists talk about the puzzle of monogamous marriage in that it is weird to see that a culture like ours would have developed it in the first place because it clearly doesn't suit the interests of elite men you'd think that the elite men would want would want to have multiple wives which of course they do but the reason they think that it's become as successful as it has is because monogamous societies do well more stable they're more they're more stable they're also more productive so they they colonize other parts of the world basically because they're wealthy and you know striving and successful and then they impose their marriage norms elsewhere think about it this way i've only just thought about this the naturalistic fallacy gets used a lot with this right look ancestrally we maybe don't have tons of evidence that we're a monogamous species therefore monogamy is not the strategy that we're supposed to go down yeah. If you accept the fact that non-monogamous societies are more unstable and are going to exist for less of an amount of time, that means that the living standards are going to be lower. That means that mortality, all, all of the things that you care about, right, are going to be out of the window. Yeah. What if monogamy for the individual sometimes can be suboptimal, but on average is optimal for the culture as a whole? In the same way as when seatbelts got introduced, people didn't want to wear them. And Mm. a lot of the time, it's not just you that you're saving. It's also other people in the car. Because if you don't have your seatbelt on, you bounce around and you smash up everybody else as well. Mm. Maybe a different way to frame monogamy is that it's it's kind of like following the law a little Mm. bit. It's it's a, a, a small individual sacrifice that you make that does perhaps make for some people suboptimal living standards, but only a little bit. But the reason that you do that is to contribute to the entire stability of society yeah i've heard i can't remember who who came up with this but i've heard monogamy referred to as sexual socialism (laughs) basically that it's a redistribution strategy for sure yeah yeah i mean i mean mentioned jordan reese again he got in trouble for saying something along these lines i can't remember exactly enforced monogamy i brought it I, i brought it up with him at the start of the year yeah, because it sounds really authoritarian. But I think what he was describing there is basically what we're describing, where it's like socially prescribed. It's not even necessarily legally required. It's just considered to be the norm. You know, cheating is considered to be bad. You can't have a second wife. Um, and yeah, there are also, I mean, there are other, there are good outcomes also in terms of things like child abuse and domestic violence, um, which obviously is something feminists are very interested in. Like polygynous societies have much higher rates of both because the households with multiple wives and their children are like full of conflict. A hundred times more likely that a child is going to be killed if they're in the household with one parent that isn't their biological parent. Yeah, a hundred times more likely. Yeah, yeah, it's ins- yeah, it's insane. It's wild. Okay, so what's yeah. what's sexual disenchantment? So. Um, Social disenchantment is basically, I took it from Max Weber, the sociologist who wrote about um, uh, disenchantment of the natural world as part of the Enlightenment. So when you, um, people used to believe pre-Enlightenment that the natural world was kind of possessed by spirits and had like agency and specialness like infused within it. And then we become more rational, whatever, post-Enlightenment and realise that actually it's all just like scientific forces at play i think that it's not it's not my term i i i, I borrowed it from aaron sabario who's an american writer um sexual disenchantment is what happens post-sexual revolution where you used to think of sex as having this kind of specialness i mean within christianity of being like a sacrament within marriage and then now it's 
stripped of all of that meaning and it just becomes basically any old so any old social interaction like it's just a means of having fun basically it doesn't necessarily mean anything I mean the point that I make in the book is actually basically no one really believes in sexual disenchantment people talk about it a lot and particularly like progressives and liberal feminists will talk about it as if as if it's an ideal like we should of course get rid of all these like stupid old-fashioned ideas about sex having some like innate specialness um but actually people don't really behave as if that's true because people behave almost always as if actually sex does have a special status and it's a special status you can't necessarily define very easily but people feel it like people care if they're if they get cheated on even in even in the polyamorous community like if you go into any polyamorous subreddit or whatever you will find people really struggling with jealousy as this like intense instinctive thing that they're trying to override and they can't quite do it um people i mean sexual harassment in the workplace like the i get really frustrated with feminists who claim simultaneously that um sex work is work and that we should like get rid of all these hang-ups about um selling sex being any different from working in mcdonald's or you know selling any other kind of service but then they also get so sensitive about any like perceived sexual impropriety in their workplace what like like being touched by a boss for instance like not even in a like a really aggressive assaulting way but just you know women getting touched on the arm or something like that or being asked out in a context that you don't really feel comfortable you know all that kind of me too stuff which is quite low level like if that if it's really the case that sex work is work then what is the problem with being asked by your boss to give them a blowjob right it's 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 work it's just a service it's like being asked to do overtime or make, or make a, a coffee. coffee or make a coffee yeah and no one actually thinks that that it's just like making a coffee so i think that the sexual disenchantment idea is really just theoretical it's a rhetorical kind of move um but actually doesn't really describe reality and doesn't really describe how people feel. I mean, it's kind of an, just an inconvenient fact that if you're, if you're trying to be super rational and you're trying to resist anything like remotely traditional or religious or, you know, anything, um, anything old fashioned, then the fact that people feel very differently about sex and they do about other things is kind of inconvenient. <laughs> it's, it's felt like an aberration, right? It's like, yeah. oh, this is just, and it, the analogy drawn with the um, non-monogamy community is so correct. One of my friends out here in Austin was telling me about the first time that his wife brought somebody else back mm. and he was on the floor of the bathroom dry retching. Um, mm. But <clears throat> at the time, he's now married, at the time was adamant that this was just him working through his ego and this is in part of the process this is part of the processing thing i'm like dude that's you're not choosing to throw up that's mm -hmm. something way 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 behind conscious programming that's yeah. innate that's built in yeah. um but is it you that is this your quote that says few liberal feminists are willing to draw the link between the culture of sexual hedonism they promote and the anxieties over campus rate that have emerged at the exact same time yeah yeah that's yeah yeah because i so i think what's going i think what's going on a lot with me too is that what what me what was described during me too and still is i guess i mean it's still it's still going on in different forms right was not always rape right like some so with like going back to weinstein for instance some of what he did was like straightforwardly illegal um and he was convicted of it therefore but a lot of what is described is much more somewhere in the middle you know much more open to interpretation um and often what women were talking about was just like feeling creeped out or feeling like like exactly this dry retching on the bathroom floor feeling like your instincts are telling you something even if you can't quite rationalize it. And often this was like expressed in terms of consent because in the liberal feminist framework, the only thing you're really allowed to talk about is consent because you because all the old fashioned norms are out the window. You're not allowed to talk about chivalry. You're not allowed to talk about um, like any kind of instinctive feeling of disgust or discomfort that you have 
kind of has to be suppressed but you are allowed to talk about consent and so everything had to be expressed in the form in like the language of consent so I talk about for instance the Aziz Ansari case you might remember I can't remember the name of the Grace I think was her her pseudonym this woman who went on a date with the actor Aziz Ansari went back to his house afterwards and he kind of he didn't rape her and he didn't do anything illegal but he just kind of subtly pressured her into doing sex things that she didn't really want to do and then later she wrote a sort of first-hand account of this um and he got in trouble but it was one of those it was it was a bit later on in me too and it was one of those ones that provoked a lot of discussion because it was because it was a borderline one like he hadn't had he done anything wrong he definitely hadn't done anything illegal um the idea that he had that he had violated her consent just didn't really stack up just based on her own story I think what's often going on here is it's to do with this pressure that women feel to have sex like men and to try and have emotionless sex and to try and just like, you know, to do the sexual disenchantment thing and just treat it like a like a leisure activity. But they can't actually quite do it. And they feel like they feel sexual disgust. They feel shame. They feel like these deep, painful emotions. And the only person sometimes to blame is the man even though he actually might not have done anything wrong really or he I mean he probably wasn't behaving like a gentleman but he wasn't doing anything illegal and he wasn't doing anything really wrong according to like the 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 standards of the day it's just that the standards of the day are not actually very good for women (laughs) that's it you've nailed it you've absolutely nailed it there and you're right the the outlet for uh pushback and, and and for distaste the only one that is there is the man, and the only framing mm. through which you can talk about this is consent, which mm. is where false allegations, I think, sometimes come in, that perhaps you repurpose ick as uh, guilt as... You must have done something criminal, yeah. Now it's rape, yeah. Mm. Mm. And, of course, the nature of it is that there are only two people there. There weren't any witnesses, and so it's everyone's like analysis of something that's gone in the past is just really difficult. Um, and, you know, to be fair to a lot of men, they're being they're being raised in the same culture where you're told that this is that women love it. You know, they, I mean, they haven't necessarily watched like Sex in the City, but it's the same. It's the same milieu where you where like having sex like a man is aspirational. And the idea is you, I, I, I write a lot in the book about pop culture examples of women who are clearly aspirational fictional characters who have loads of casual sex love it like don't have any emotional connection to the men that they use for sex and this is this is like this is this is aspirational you know and so and and young men are seeing this as well and they're also watching porn which gives a completely unrealistic realistic perspective on what women like and so you know they're clueless basically <laughs> well, they're playing by the rules of the game as well or at least yeah. by the the cultural influences of the game that they think are going on another yeah. another problem that you have here uh, in the uh, asymmetric warfare of the sexes is that men who begin to get a little bit of resentment for women let's say that they've had their heart broken in the past but that they are um within the standard where they can keep having sex right they're not one of the underclass they're actually someone that can keep on doing it if they become aware of the fact that girls are trying to play this game of detached emotionless sex if they fully become conscious of that they go oh okay let's see who can win at this game the most because it's not going to be you it's going mm. to be me. And they can, you know, this isn't to say, again, on average, this isn't to say that some men don't get attached after the first time they have sex with a girl. Some of my friends fall pretty hard. Uh, but they, if they can weaponize that, they can do a, a ton of damage as well. And mm. yeah, I, I don't know. I, there's maybe an argument that everybody just needs to not be able to have sex until the age of 25. And then when they do, they're like, look, I'm fully emotionally balanced. I've been through a bunch of breakups. I didn't have sex during the during the relationship. I kind of know what I like and what I don't like and blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I, it's just so what many... What you're of... describing there is marriage, Chris. <laughs> ah, that, that used to be what it was. I've you weren't allowed to have sex before you got married. Which gave, which gave like men in particular a massive incentive to get their shit together How because so? if you because if you can't if you can't get married until you've say like achieved certain adult things like you've got a job you've got um, a house you know or like you've got 
whatever the system is, like a certain amount of money that you can demonstrate your sort of um, eligibility as a husband, if you have to get all of your ducks in a row before you can have sex, I mean, you can potentially buy sex, but you can't have it like socially illicit, then that that's a huge incentive to behave yourself and to do pro-social stuff. Whereas if you have a scenario now where either either you're like attractive enough that you can get sex casual sex without having to to do anything really except be like moderately charming or you can get sex through or you or you have access to porn which like gives you the the gives some of the same like feedback from your environment as if you were actually having sex like I mean, this would get so. This will get so much worse with sex robots, where all of a sudden you can like basically bypass all of the effort that you might historically have had to put in in order to access sex. You can just buy a sex robot, and you can spend your whole life playing video games, never going to gym, never showering, never having a job, and you still get access to this thing that your ancestors like <laughs> fought teeth and nail to get access to. Even without the sex robots, men are retreating. I think from yeah. from the dating market, uh, terrifying, terrifying rates. There's a a quote that Rob Henderson came up with, which is this a similar sort of dynamic that we're talking about here. It says norms were loosened around being an absentee father, so more men took the option, but nobody wants to admit it because it upsets people. Instead, we retreat to discussions of poverty and economics because talking about family and parenting makes people feel weird and judgmental. But young mm. men will only do what's expected of them. And a lot did used to be expected. There were social norms to work hard, provide, take care of loved ones, and so on. Today, these norms have largely dissolved. Young men have responded accordingly. Yeah, yeah, he's very, very smart, Robinson. He's completely right. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that I think that the the line I have in the book about Debbie Dads is that when when motherhood became a biological choice for women, fatherhood became a social choice for men. What do you mean by that? In that when contraception and legalised abortion became available, I mean, the sh- that basically killed the shotgun marriage pretty much immediately because it no longer served the same social purpose that it had before. Um, but the nature of contraception is such that nothing is 100% foolproof. And actually the pill, particularly in its earliest incarnations, wasn't that great and still isn't that great because it depends a lot on the user using it properly. So if you're using it properly, it's like 99% plus effective. But in reality, it's more like 91%. So you end up with a lot of unplanned pregnancies. And there will always be some women who don't want to have a termination for whatever reason. Um, But if you're in a social context where like that isn't necessarily considered to be a link between sex and reproduction and getting pregnant is considered to be like this unwelcome aberration rather than literally the whole point, then it becomes much more socially acceptable for men to not stick around because they say, well, you chose this, you know, you're you're on your own, which is, yeah, I mean, obviously there have always been cases of people I've had some critics point this out you know there have always been cases of men abandoning their wives or abandoning women that they, they that they made pregnant outside of marriage you know there have always been scandals there have always been unwanted pregnancies whatever like that's absolutely true but rates of out of wedlock births now are completely historically unprecedented which is kind of weird because you would think that giving women the technology that enables them to c- control their fertility would reduce single motherhood, but it's done the opposite because humans are humans are complicated creatures. That's what I learned from Mary Harrington, that you introduce the pill, single, yeah. single motherhood goes up. Like, yeah. who, who the fuck could have predicted that? Right? You know, that's four <laughs> right. degrees of detachment away. You know, it, it's so interesting, but also kind of tragic. Mm. But it's it seems like women it was it was a perfect storm right you had the the decoupling socially then you had the decoupling biologically but you mm-hmm. haven't had the decoupling emotionally mm. it's still that fundamentally there, there will be some women that are able to have sex like a man and there will mm. be some able there's a man the men that are able to have sex like a man 
But on average, it, it used to be something that you worked toward for a long time. It used to be the sort of thing. And think about now, I was uh, sent another article by Rob the other day where he was talking about why is it that parents tend to select when when their daughter or son brings home a new potential partner, they look at things like job title, earnings, family, and he asked, why is that the case? Why is it that you look at these when, you know, they're not looking at how hot they are, not looking mm. at, at, at attraction and, and stuff like mm. that. Even kindness kind of takes a little bit of a backseat and mm. it's less falsifiable, basically. The fact is, look, these are the things that are going to be the most likely to become um, grandchild optimizing algorithms. Do yeah. you have status? Do you have money? Do you have the right family behind you? If you've yeah. got those, I'm probably going to have grandchildren. Uh, all of the other ones are wishy-washy and, and, and kind of uh, easy to to fake in a way. Mm -hmm. um, why, why is it then that loveless sex isn't empowering? Yeah, I mean, cause, because your animal brain, which none of us are completely in control of, for women in particular, even if there are some outliers, as you mentioned, I mean, often the outliers, like often women who who don't get attached to sex, for instance, have like a history of sexual trauma. There's often not a very healthy reason behind it, but you know, like accepting the fact that there are outliers, your animal brain thinks that this guy is going to knock you up and like you are going to become a profoundly vulnerable mother baby dyad. You know, like human infants are insanely vulnerable they need so much more care than any other as as far as i know any other species young um and mothers are also extremely vulnerable in the later stages of pregnancy and in and during infancy you have to put so much energy and sacrifice so much in order to raise this child to adulthood and that before like five minutes ago in our evolutionary history was what happened or was certainly what you risked happening if you had sex had heterosexual sex and so like our brains are still primed for that and that's the whole that's the whole purpose behind emotional attachment to your sexual partner and also the whole purpose behind like choosing your sexual partner and the fact that women do tend to be a lot choosier than men there's these quite funny studies that have been done several times where they um they get like quite attractive strangers to go up to men and women, I think on university campuses normally and proposition them. And when the, when the women proposition male strangers, they almost always say yes. Or if any, they say no, it's because they have a girlfriend or whatever. Whereas when the men proposition the women, they always say no, because women like their filter is impregnable. Um, and there's a reason for that. It's because you don't want some, some like, to be knocked up by some bozo. It's, this is one of the reasons why prostitution is as traumatic as it is. I mean, there are all there are all of the physical risks involved in prostitution, like rates of murder are insanely high. You know, it's 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 if we were to compare it to another profession, it would be by far the most dangerous profession ever. Like rates of PTSD are much higher than in the military, for instance. But one of the reasons why it's so profoundly distressing is that women have this really, really strong instinct to like vet their sexual partners and to only have sex with men who seem like good prospects. And women also have a very high, a very low sexual disgust threshold, which means that they get the ick very readily with a man that they don't fancy. And what, what women in prostitution are basically required to do is to override that and to suppress those instincts. If you talk to women who've who've experienced it they often talk about like working really hard to dissociate from their physical feelings it is that is that retching on the bathroom floor thing i mean actually rachel moran who's a prostitution survivor and has written this amazing book called paid for which is a memoir of her experiences um she talks about that the fact that not vomiting is one of the most important skills a prostitute can have because your 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 physical urge to run away and to cry and to vomit is that strong that you have to like fight it down and I think that if you know of, in a much less extreme circumstances obviously but when women are trying to like to 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 
to play the masculine role and to imitate male sexuality and to enjoy sex in the way that they think they're supposed to, they are basically obliged to suppress their instincts, which isn't isn't at all psychologically healthy. Has normalising sex work like OnlyFans been a benefit for women? I mean, there clearly are some women on OnlyFans who make a lot of money from it. So there are some winners. I mean, they they are very unusual. Most women on OnlyFans probably make a loss in terms of the amount of time they have to spend because the Pareto distribution on OnlyFans is wild. And most of the women who do really well on it are already celebrities and already quite wealthy. So this idea that you can just be like as long as you're sufficiently pretty, you log on and you're making a fortune is not true. And I'm sure has been deliberately whipped up that idea by OnlyFans because they're the only people actually really profiting at the end of the day. Um, I mean, I think the OnlyFans is not like street prostitution or brothel prostitution. Like, it's clearly not the same. I it, Like, it's pretty gross and, the, and you will have men asking you to do things that really turn your stomach but it's clearly not like physically dangerous. I think that the main risk of OnlyFans is your ability to have a long-term relationship afterwards because you end up putting your images out in the world and you can't get them back because that's the nature of the internet and often OnlyFans creators get their images stolen and so they'll be shared and they don't even get any money from it. And the risk is in the future that even though men don't always admit it, the sexual double standard is still actually really alive and well. If you So the sexual double standard being when men are kind of permitted to be a bit promiscuous and that's okay socially, but women tend to be punished for promiscuity. I think that OnlyFans goes beyond promiscuity. You know, the double standard didn't account. It's not men wanking on camera and then trying to find a wife and them saying, uh, my friends shared something in a WhatsApp chat earlier on and that kind of looks a little bit like you. Mm. Uh, what about um, normalizing uh, like love sex workers? Like s- sex workers are, you should be completely fine with your partner doing OnlyFans or uh, perhaps even escorting. I mean, crazy, what kind of, yeah. I mean, either, I think if I think if a man is really comfortable with that, that's like a red flag to me, honestly. Like, I, again, it's an example of men suppressing their instincts because the, the, the instinct towards jealousy is so strong and, again, has such an obvious evolutionary origin to it um, because if you're putting loads of resources into raising children that you've had with this woman you want to know they're yours like that's mate guarding is what the um biologists call it and it's it's so common that i think it's considered to be a human universal and yeah like there are there are loads of sort of unwelcome phenomena that come from that you know jealousy is often um the motive behind domestic violence for instance it's like you know you mentioned the naturalistic fallacy like the fact that it's natural doesn't mean it's necessarily good but it does also mean that trying to completely override it is probably not going to work <laughs> like you have to find a way of accommodating your instincts you can't just try and suppress them and try and like like rewrite the human blueprint well that's because- where that's where i think the um it's not men that are encouraging women to do only fans i don't see men on the internet saying that you should go and you girl should ditch your job and go and do it. The only people online saying sex work is real work seems to be women. Yes, men are the ones that are paying for their images once they're in the game. Mm -hmm. But I think that's because once women cross that threshold and become a a sex worker or whatever, they're almost kind of not subhuman, but they're they're in a different category, right? And it's like, oh, well, they're they're doing it. I didn't get them into it, so I'm just going to continue to fund them. But if you were to say... To most men, I think, would you advise that pretty girl to get into OnlyFans so that you can see her nudes? Mm. Most of them would say, probably not, probably not. But almost every healthy man would say no, right? They'd say, no, I, I, I'll try and go out with her or maybe she should just go and enjoy her life or do whatever. But once they're in the game, that's what's going to happen. But you have this this very bizarre sort of cartel, I don't know, it's like uh, self, not self-oppression, but like... <clears throat> self-capitalization from women of women encouraging other women to go and do the game 
despite the fact that the chances of you making money on OnlyFans is uh, minusculely low when it comes to actually making the tens of thousands of dollars a day that the the biggest creators make. And yeah, I mean, even even if you were able to have an unbelievably secure OnlyFans that was never able to leak your photos online, you have two choices for the remainder of your life when you get into talking to a new partner. You can either tell them the truth mm -hmm. and regardless of how comfortable that guy is with his sexuality, finding out that his missus, forget body count, even if you've only slept with one other person, but that was something that you did, you can't like left brain your way out of thinking that that is, oh God, well, if she did that in the past, does this mean that she's maybe going to, she's a risk for promiscuity in the future? Like the cook radar is so hyper attuned for men, which is why we get more jealous. Or the other one is to lie to him. Mm -hmm. Cuck radar is interesting phrase. <laughs> Good coinage game. Because I have you. Because I have used the. I've. I've. I have to write it in the book, but I've, um, like talked about it on Twitter. Nonce radar, which I. <laughs> <laughs> I think that women have really strongly. I mean, I think men do as well, but I think women in particular have a really strong like. It's. I think it's slightly a sexual disgust thing. It's that feeling of like this guy is creepy. And I think that it, I think it's like female intuition, right? And I think it's coming, it's probably partly coming from wanting to protect yourself. It's also partly wanting to protect your children. You've got that, like, this guy's bad news. Yeah. The if I'm going to sleep with him, what's he going to do to the kids perhaps yeah. down the line? I yeah. saw, I got to tell you about this uh, meme that I saw. So Carl Benjamin, Sargon of Akkad, a guy who uh, has incredibly conservative views about this stuff, but aligns completely with what we're saying here. He posted a meme the other day and it had a girl from OnlyFans in like a bikini or lingerie or whatever sort of dancing away on one side and it had Michael Scott from The Office on the other sort of looking strangely. And the mm. text said, we call it female empowerment and they will dance naked for the price of a cheeseburger. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, th this question you raise about why women encouraging each other to do it. You're right. I mean, one exception I would give is I do have a friend who went on a date with a guy who said, you're so hot, you should be on OnlyFans. And she did not go on a date with him again because it was just so obviously, I know. Failing was, strategy, I think. Yeah, because the way that she interpreted it, and I think correctly, was that he was he was clearly not regarding her as like wife material. Right. And this is this is, I think, a, an error that women do make sometimes where they don't have a good understanding of male sexuality and they don't. It's really interesting. I don't know if you've read David Buss's book, Bad Men. I was, absolutely yeah, love it. Yeah, I brought him on for, the sh for that. Fantastic book. Yeah. And he talks about the fact that women tend to assess like short term partners and long term partners based on the same uh, qualities. They want the same things in all the men they have sex with men don't do that they have a much lower standard for their short-term partners than they do for long-term partners and so they will be willing to have sex with a woman that they absolutely would not marry they would not even introduce to their friends and i think a lot of women don't necessarily know that and so they will interpret sexual advances from men as flattering when actually they can are potentially like cheap you know this is the genesis of the alpha widow right like this is what M many girls that are liberated sexually and using tinder and stuff like that don't get and I, I think that this is another i'm I'm actually not so convinced about quite how big of an Im of an effect this is i'd need to see rob go and do some research about it but certainly women are able to sleep with men that they wouldn't be able to get into a relationship with but the reverse yeah. isn't true and yeah. there is an argument that <clears throat> the the aftershock of this means that those women are going to constantly pine after the nine out of ten guy that's worth half a million and so, all that. Mm. I, I'm not sure about how long that would last for and the echoes of that and stuff like that. But I certainly think that um, what mm. porn has done to men, which is to teach them that women are to be objectified – is similar in part to what OnlyFans has done to women, which is to teach some women that men are commercial vehicles to be exploited mm, and that their yeah. sex is just a, it's a commodity. You can trade it yeah. like anything else. Yeah, and it's not, I think as well, some women who are already like posting a lot of raunchy photos on Instagram don't necessarily feel like OnlyFans is that big a step. It's just a bit more explicit and you get paid for it so you can sort of see the reasoning and what some women say and I I get it is that 
you know, yes, maybe that it means that some men in the future wouldn't want to be in a relationship with me because I've got these photos out in the world. But I wouldn't want to be in a relationship with a man like that anyway if he's going to judge me sort of thing. And the problem with that is that if you actually look at research on men, it's like that's basically all men. They might not say it because it's not really socially acceptable to admit to, but actually it's basically all men. Like to the point that if a man isn't bothered, I'd wonder if he had a cuckold fetish. You know, and then and then that like obviously brings complications to your relationship. What did you learn about porn when you looked at that? For the book. I mean the thing with porn that I think a lot of people don't fully appreciate is that online porn is a completely different beast from like Playboy of the sixties. I mean, I start the book by writing about Playboy and writing about Hugh Hefner. And clearly like there were feminist writing at the time about porn being really grim for women there's this famous cover of a, a, a an issue of hustler i can't remember what year it was published in probably the 70s where a woman is being like um ground up in a meat grinder and her legs are just sticking out the top it's really like of like deliberately grotesque image and feminists got so upset about it at the time i think rightly but like they had no idea what would happen with the internet and I think that the thing that's so sinister about online porn is that there's this there's this quote I use in the book that the nature of like techno capitalism is that we are all either above the algorithm or below the algorithm. We're either writing these, we're either creating these 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 pieces of tech or we're being influenced by them because we're using them or we're you know sexually interacting with people who are, who are using them and porn is such an amazing example of this because it's just profit driven that's the point of it it's not it's not interested in the well-being of its consumers i mean whatever porn have like porn have, have various like advertising efforts to try and sanitize what they do but the whole the whole point of it is making money and they're really good at it and the way that they do it is by basically creating a super stimulus which adults uses brains and the like they're incredibly adept at basically arousing the human body the human animal like we can't really resist our animal instincts as quickly as possible so you log on to one of these platforms and you look at the front page and like everything is designed to make you as horny as possible as quickly as possible and the the way the platforms are designed is to like introduce you to the super stimulus and then introduce you to something even more stimulating and even more stimulating and even more stimulating and so you end up and it, i mean so a lot of people are able to use porn casually quite a lot of people don't use it at all like a surprising including men surprising proportion do you know how but, much that is so I read a survey that about a quarter of millennial men haven't used it in the last month, which is quite a lot. But the 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 there's a minority of users who are like helpless power users. This, yeah, yeah. Like again, it's it, Pareto is at play as well. Like there is a small number of men who watch. I can't remember the the, the figure I quote in the book. It's something like two percent of users use it for like seven hours a week or more. It's a lot of porn. Do you know um, Mary Harrington's l law of fap entropy? <laughs> yes. That whatever you start out wanking to will get progressively more disgusting over time and you'll be down yeah. in the depths of blueberry porn before you know it. Well, yeah, I, I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like, just anecdotally, there are some very strange things that compulsive porn users end up being turned on by. And, like, to the point where they, they can't even like erectile dysfunction being a huge problem they can't actually have sex with a real person what's the name for that it's not ground pounding what's it called it's called something oh death grip syndrome death ground pounding where the fuck did i pull that from yeah death <laughs> that's much more unpleasant <laughs> <laughs> i mean death grip yeah, syndrome yeah, yeah. isn't that nice either yeah and i talk i write in the book about um cultural death grip syndrome which is where we've got an incredibly pornified public life you've got so much more like sex scenes on TV, advertising billboards, whatever. I mean, like sex scenes on TV have wrapped up so quickly just in my lifetime that it used to be edgy. And now it's like, you know, every drama has to have 
like super, super explicit sex scenes every five minutes, whatever. So you've got that on the one hand. Well, I don't think we've ever had this much explicit sex in public life. But then also people aren't actually having sex. You have the sex recession, the sex depression, where you've got, as you were saying, you've got loads of men who are virgins up into their 20s and so on. It's this really weird, um, what's the word? It's, it's, it's this really weird contradiction and it's one that the feminists of the 70s who were so upset about porn didn't foresee interestingly like they were concerned that porn would inspire sexual violence and like it's complicated because it probably does a bit like in some circumstances so for instance choking porn has become so popular and is so mainstream in a way that it wasn't at all 20 years ago. It used to be considered a really niche BDSM thing. And even actually in the BDSM community, it was considered a bit risky. Whereas now, like, survey data is crazy for millennials and younger, the proportion of young women who report being choked by their partners, um, sometimes asking for it and sometimes sometimes non-consensually. But it's, like, just become insanely mainstream really quickly. And the only mechanism that I can see for that is porn, that it's it's inspiring a change in sexual culture. So so sometimes, yeah, it's inspiring more aggressive behaviour from its users. But equally, actually, sometimes it's like basically neutering users, like they become actually incapable of having sex with a real person and even become incapable of being aroused by just normal porn because they're so... They like they go they go down the rabbit hole. Laura so, Flap entropy secondary. continues to yeah, yeah. What do what do most modern feminists think about porn now then? Do they think that it's liberating women and allowing them to earn and sex work is real work? It's complicated because I think that the like most liberal feminists and sex positive feminists would definitely think that there's nothing like inherently bad about porn and would absolutely defend the right of women to produce it and so on. But I think that there's increasingly a view that actually it's not, it's not great. I did a um, debate at the Oxford union earlier this year and the, the, the proposition was something like this house welcomes a new porn. It was mostly about only fans, but it ended up being about porn in general. And I thought I'd be slaughtered because I thought that the, you know, the students were going to be so sex positive and so anti everything I had to say. And actually I won, surprisingly. I had some quite aggressive questions from the floor, but actually at the end, um, our side won. Why so do you I, think that was? Because I think actually this generation, I mean, these 18 year olds, right? So they've, or a bit older, they, they're the generation who had porn, like on their private computers, on their phones from adolescence onwards. I mean, I'm 30, so I didn't actually have my own smartphone or whatever until teens and above but these are the kids who who had it from like adolescence and would would expect to be exposed to porn really young and it was really formative in their sexuality and I think that it's hard not to not to recognize the like the downsides of that the thing that I see online I, I don't know a single guy that is pro porn Guys are either neutral porn or anti-porn. Like, and the ones that are anti-porn are vehement about it. Do they tend to be anti-porn from like the ethical women stuff, or because of the effect on them? I can. <laughs> <laughs> Not from the effect on women's stuff. No. no, no um, no. I think that I, I I actually think that the guys that are behaviorally addicted to porn or ha have got friends that do or are scared that they're going to become it. I actually think in part that they see the women that are um, a part of the porn machine as part of the oppressor. I think that they think that they are creating the content which is causing me to uh, have to fap three or four times a day and, and feel disgusted with myself or waste time or have this sort of super normal stimuli problem of not being able to get it up. And, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's another one of those things where everybody's losing, you know? Mm. It, it, it's except for, the, except for the owners of mind geek they're fine yeah didn't one of those one of those went on a podcast a few years ago i remember hearing about how huge that mind geek empire is it's like mm -hmm. more than 50 percent of all porn streaming on the internet goes through them remembering that porn is still the biggest traffic source on the internet and they've got it's wild yeah mm -hmm. i uh 
Aren't they British? And they're basically Isn't unknown. One of the guys British as well, I'm no, sure. No, they're Canadian. The oh, guy okay. who has OnlyFans is British. Yes, yeah. He's a, but, I, I was trying to get him on. I was trying to bring him on because he seems like a very interesting guy. And I, I was really fascinated by their attempted move away from explicit content. It was obvious that they had... I don't think that that came from altruistic means. I think that that came from probably investor problems and mm. shit to do with banks. So Chelsea Ferguson, if you know her... She owns admireme.vip, which is another version of OnlyFans. She was on OnlyFans. She found out that it was a problem. She's a friend. I've been friends with her for a very long time. She's got a huge private Snapchat. She's been a stripper for a long time in Newcastle. Uh, mm -hmm. And she was telling me that she had to go to Germany. Germany was the only place that she could get a bank that would process payments when they found out what she was doing. So <clears throat> the back end of stuff, I think that that was the... The story about OnlyFans wasn't that they were trying to clean up the image. It's that they were probably having investor problems and, and operational shit on the back end. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Because that was one of the... My memory of the timeline is that that big New York Times piece about Pornhub and MindGeek came out. And Visa in particular, possibly some other companies, I can't remember, got a cold feet and thinking that they were inadvertently funding child rape images... And so I guess that that, I mean, I mean, OnlyFans has loads of kids on it, realistically. And I know that they try, they say that they try to make sure that it's only adults, but they can't realistically do that. There are loads of stories anecdotally of girls, you know, 14, 15 year old girls or whatever, putting their images up there. It is inevitable if, on any of these platforms. You can't really protect against it. What do you mean when you say that people are not products? So that's the, yeah, that's the... <laughs> when I mentioned at the beginning that I had that big Twitter storm about my uh, about my chapter titles, and that was kind of the most all these like left wing sex positive people absolutely outraged at me saying that people aren't products. <laughs> I mean, it comes back to the sexual disenchantment point that if you if you really think that sex is meaningless, it's just like making coffee, blah blah blah, that people can just like sell sexual access to themselves like they'd sell any other kind of service or any other kind of product like it's internally consistent and it's the sort of the the phrase that I use in that chapter is that it's the logic of the punter I mean that's what punters think that they can just they don't really see prostituted women as being properly human I think I mean based on the way that they write about them that doesn't that doesn't seem to be how they view them there's like appalling um review platforms online where punters will review women that they've bought sex from and there's like no human feeling in there like there's like true psychopathy on display so so like that probably is the only population who actually believe in sexual disenchantment um the women they're buying sex from certainly don't and i like thinking away from the more extreme end of it in terms of prostitution as well, just thinking about things like dating apps, which are also kind of designed, like they're also sort of con continuous with the logic of the punter in that they are designed to be like shopping apps. That's how they feel. You don't feel using them that different from using like ASOS or eBay or whatever, because you swipe, swipe, swipe and select your product. Um, I mean, or not, of course, if you're like, an incel who doesn't get any matches but for, for for high status men and for women that is how it that's how it's experienced and it's got a really really consumerist kind of energy the cat the whole like casual sex phenomenon um which ought to be the sort of thing that the left are really opposed to <laughs> you know my, my my colleagues at the new statesman like this ought this ought to be you know we're talking about this multi-billion pound global empire of the porn industry we're talking about like, a really consumerist attitude towards other people's bodies and minds like this 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 isn't conservative or it shouldn't be like this should be 101 anti-capitalist critique coming from the left mm -hmm. but it isn't and I think that that's because a lot of people on the left have prioritized like owning the cons and are more interested in tearing down bourgeois sexual norms and basically promoting free love at all costs than they are in thinking about where this has actually led to a, led us to. And I think that this, the last 60, 70 years post-sexual revolution period has been, has been a big experiment in what happens 
if you disconnect sex from reproduction and you basically discard all of the like quite finely tuned norms that used to exist basically to keep young horny people away from each other i mean the, the way that this is interpret this history is interpreted by feminists often is is this all those social norms exist to control female sexuality and they did but they also existed to control male sexuality and the purpose of it wasn't to oppress women it wasn't motivated by misogyny it was motivated by the fact that if sex leads to reproduction then that's everyone's concern like the, the, that matters to the community because if you've got people young couples producing illegitimate children like that's that matters to the family that matters to the community it's 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 essential in a world without contraception to control young people's sexuality and that's what those norms existed for and we threw them out the window very rapidly and we've basically seen this play out over the last however many decades and i think that the the results are in and they're not very promising That's really, really good. I, I learned from Mary when she came on the show about the fact that a lot of the rules and the norms that are set are by the elite, and mm. they're usually not the ones that suffer the impact. It's a luxury belief, right? Yeah. To hold that um, men don't need to hold the door open for you and that having chivalry and constraints on male behavior, <clears throat> that's not needed by some upper-middle-class woman whose husband has got a postgraduate degree because mm -hmm. there are maybe levels of education or, or norm enforcement that have occurred just through his upbringing and her upbringing that means that it doesn't matter. What you don't think about is the, the underclass or, or the working class guy and girl who perhaps haven't had those same sort of levels of norms enforced. And mm -hmm. maybe they don't know that not hitting your wife is that big of a deal. And then when the culture starts to erode and evaporate that away, you go, well... I, the people that made the rules or that encouraged the norms to be dissolved are not the ones that are suffering their dissolving. Yeah. Rob Henson actually, I think, uses polyamory as his one of his examples isn't he, in his, his original Luxury Beliefs essay, where if you're a high status person, let's say in like the Bay Area where everyone loves polyamory, like polyamory is really, is just like cool. And you can, if it all falls in a heap, it doesn't matter because you've got your money and your status and all of your stability to fall back on and everyone will just sort of think that you're a bit bohemian whereas if you're a working class underclass woman who's basically you know living polyamory like having lots of different partners and lots of different children by them people one will think you're trash but two like your life becomes so challenging because you've got you've got all these children to look after and you don't have the reliable support of a partner and like you're at risk of absolutely everything falling apart but but this is but yeah it's, it is a luxury belief in the sense that saying that that's a good thing and 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 resisting the um resisting the traditional norms that used to that used to exist gives status to rich people well think about it. i i really like the idea that um, beating the other side was more important than raising up the people of your political party. And I think that that's very true. There was a study that I saw uh, around about 2012, surveys of uh, Democrats and Republicans, the um, proportions twisted and they, they flipped from I vote for my party because I like my party to I vote mm -hmm. for my party because I dislike the other party. Pretty yeah. much more, more people were doing protest votes because of a hatred of the other rather than a love of the similar. Yeah. And you go, well, I, uh, how easily is that to be weaponized? You know, and how, how many perverse incentives are you going to create there? You mentioned at the beginning about um, how my book will be received in America. And um, not all, but a lot of the a lot of my friends who are also writing on similar things like Mary and Nina and so on are British and British feminism is much more, it's much more permissible to say this stuff than it is in the States in general. And I think the reason for that is that we don't really have a Christian right in the UK. So there isn't really any like fearsome enemy that we all need to be focused against and things like abortion rights are rock solid pretty much like not in ireland but in the mainland uk um like that doesn't feel under threat and i think that's what it is that because 
I think American feminists are just so focused all the time on like often shadow boxing against the Christian right in the sense that I think they overstate their influence and their power and they're, and they're kind of stuck in the past a little bit. And there's this like underdog mentality that we, things like constantly having to reassert like, oh, you shouldn't be ashamed of sex. You should be, you know, more. it's like, we've won that fight. Come on. I think it's like, look at any, any newspaper, magazine, TV channel, whatever, like the idea that women are not allowed to say they enjoy sex is like 50 years out of date. Come on. So they're so focused on a like somewhat imaginary enemy that they can't actually interrogate the coherence of their own views. Whereas I think in the UK that isn't, that isn't so much the case at all. And actually there's a lot more things like trans politics or whatever, which we haven't gone into in, in, in this discussion, but is, is much more cross party is not there isn't this like really fierce dichotomy politically which I think gives more space for thinking critically like I, I feel like I can write this book and I'm not going to get pegged as a crazy conservative I might be wrong about that we'll wait and see but, how, yeah. how should people act then given all of this everything <laughs> that we've gone through how should people act so I mean I, I I do basically make the case in the book for for, for 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 being a bit more old fashioned on some stuff. Like I a lot of the a lot of that section of it is directed more at women than at men. So like I think for instance it's a good idea for women not to have sex on the first date, or not even to have sex in the first three months, because that that gives you the opportunity to assess whether or not he considers you to be good time only, or if your wife material stuff like that, which like you could basically read in most agony arts from like the 1950s, which is obviously what I get accused of in my reviews. Um, but also they, like there was, there was a reason for it. It wasn't, it wasn't motivated by misogyny. You know, there was a, there was like a proper principle behind it. Um, I mean, similarly for men, I, I mean, I don't know what, I don't know what advice I have to offer for incels, to be honest. I think I'm probably not the right person to offer any kind of advice because typically they don't like advice in any case no. uh, from like a fish teaching a fisherman how to fish type thing. <laughs> yeah. it, it just, it goes down badly. I had uh, Nama Cates on um, a couple of months ago, maybe six months ago, and she's done tons of work, tons of yeah. research, like firsthand research into it. A lot of people were unhappy about the fact that she wasn't someone that could understand their plight. Um, mm -hmm. So, okay. So for women, don't have sex on the first day not having sex for three months so th there's an interesting uh insight i learned from jeffrey miller evolutionary psychologist so mm -hmm. his book mate that he wrote with tucker max which should have been so much bigger than it was it's such a shame that it didn't do like mental numbers because it's great <clears throat> he explained about how um slut shaming is a sort of game theoretic enforcement mechanism to ensure that the price of sex doesn't descend lower than women want it to which is why most women are the enforcers of slut shaming not men men actually yeah. have an incentive for slut shaming to go away um yeah. but one of the problems that you have here is you can kind of see ease of sex or or, or, or speed towards um uh, being accepting of having sex with a potential new partner as kind of being a price Right. And yeah. as you start to extend that out, the price that the man has to pay continues to go up and up and up. So you really do need a bit of a God's eye view, because if every woman tomorrow said, right, no sex until three months, th mm. that's fine. That's the playing field. Maybe mm. you would have more men that would sort of duck out of the dating game. But over time, they would acclimatize. Right. Because we acclimatized to no sex before marriage. That was there. So, yeah, yeah I think. OK, so what else? What, what else can people do? I mean, so, yeah. So on that point about. um yeah, I mean, st strike breakers, basically, <laughs> for everyone else. The, I think that one of the things I hope comes from the book is that a lot of young women in particular, because they've not yet learned through life experience, are phenomenally ignorant about the reality of male sexuality and the reality of sexual difference. And so don't realise, for instance, some of what we've spoken about, the fact that, like, um, the sexual double standard is alive and well and... Um, a lot of like men can have emotion of sex in a way that women can't and all of this. And so we'll interpret, for instance, um, they, will, they will misinterpret a lot of male behavior and end up making decisions that are actually not in their best interest because they, they think that, you know, the guy who wants to sleep with them must want something more from them afterwards. And then, and then are like, 
you know, learn the hard way that that's not true. And I think that actually if if there was more knowledge, widespread knowledge about the existence of these facts, I think actually that young women's behaviour could change quite quickly. Because at the moment, for instance, the like you go on TikTok or whatever and you get young women will do things like show off their bruises that they've got from having rough sex with men who like obviously hate them but there is it's a status symbol because it's a sign of being oh look I'm so attractive and particularly things like choking a lot of women interpret choking as being a sign of like passionate love like in like a 50 shades of gray way like I want you so much I'll do anything to have you is the way that this is like interpreted in the romantic imagination that's not generally how the men who are doing it interpret it at all so there's this like mutual miscomprehension where each sex is doing something and they actually don't like realize how the other side is interpreting it i think if more women realize that it would it would no longer be high status to be showing off your bruises on tiktok because actually the like the truth of it is that basically any moderately good looking young woman can get as many partners as she wants and can get them to do you know if if she if if she asks them to choke her they will it's not a sign of being super attractive but it's misinterpreted as being as such. So I think that if there were more, I think there was a better understanding than some of the incentives would change, which would be a good thing for young women. Louise Perry, ladies and gentlemen, I really, really enjoy the book. I think that the uh, group of women that we've got in the UK, you, Mary, Nina, we need to come up with a new net. This can be a public service announcement to the people that are still listening. Um, before we started, we came up with the name of Based British Women, but then realized that the acronym of BBW can unfortunate, is yeah. problematic. <laughs> um, so if you've got an alternative that the girls can use, that would be great. Um, but I, yeah, I, I think that it's really great. I, I really, really like all of the work that you guys have put out. Um, where should people go? They want to read more of your stuff online. Where should they go? So there's a book, obviously, which is out already in the UK, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, um, and it's out at the end of August in America. And I write a weekly column for the New Statesman. you got a Substack as well, right? No, I don't actually. Oh. I, I started one very briefly, but then I got off for the New Statesman job and I can't do two columns in one week, so. Take the money. Louise, I appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.